We're going to start by saying thank you so much to all of you guys, okay? You guys did it. You guys hit the subscribe button enough. You pushed me up over 100,000 subscribers to my channel. That is insane, guys. I never expected something like this. Um, I literally just started making these videos for my own employees uh, as a training aid, just kind of like, hey, this is how we want to do things when you're looking for leaks or looking for shorts or whatever. I think my very first video, it's still on my channel, go all the way back to the beginning, is me working on a beer walk-in, showing my guys, hey, when we have a blown fuse, we don't just replace the fuse and turn it on. We check for shorts, you know, and, and that was the whole thing. And, and I've continued to make that style of videos, you know, with my employees in mind, um, and I definitely think about your guys' uh, requests and comments and different things like that and try to remember. And, and I hope that my channel has grown, but I also hope that you guys see that I'm trying to keep it my own channel still, right? Yes, I have sponsors and partners that I work with, but I'm trying to keep this my style. All my partners and sponsors, they all work with me and they know that I want to keep it just like it is, okay? Thank you guys so very much. I also have to give a big shout out to my buddy Rich that made me that awesome 100,000 subscriber sign out of stainless steel in the back. I threw a LED light behind it. I still have a little bit of tweaking to do on it, but thank you, Rich and Ike. Ike, give Rich the idea. Thank you so very much for that, okay? This was awesome. Um, thanks again. Uh, if you haven't already, please check out my website, hvacrvideos.com. Uh, cool merch available on there, hats, beanies, shirts, uh, a couple different shirt designs. We have women's shirts designs. Um, it really helps to support the channel, so please check it out, okay? Let's get on with the video. This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. The customer's complaint is that the glycol unit is not working. Um, they're saying that the beer is pouring warm out of the taps. But of course, I always come into the beer walk at first to make sure that it's cold in here, and it is. It's about 35 degrees. So it does seem like it is a glycol unit problem. Uh, the glycol unit lines, it's gonna go up right there and then it goes underground to the bar right there. So these lines right here are not being cooled properly because they've got warm, foamy beer coming out of the beer taps. So we're gonna jump on top of the walk-in and see if we can't figure out what's going on. Okay, this is my glycol unit right here. It is a cool tech unit. Uh, it says 51 degrees on the thermostat and I can hear the compressor clicking on and off uh, at the internal overload. So I'm gonna go ahead and climb up the rest of the way, get my tools up here. We're gonna open it up and investigate. I was able to get the whole top cover pulled off, which is kind of nice. Although, what the heck? Look at this. Look at that braze joint right there. What the heck is that? That looks like a factory. I've never worked on this. Although this was installed in 2016, but good grief. Yeah, that looks OEM. This, I don't think this unit's ever been worked on. Wow. That's really uh, special looking right there. Okay. All right, well, compressor's red hot. And uh, we need to get into the electrical section right there. It's rather tight up here, too. I'm... You can see I'm teetering on the edge of the walk-in, so I don't think I have, no, I don't even have the ability to push this unit over because of the refrigeration lines right there. And you also gotta be careful when you're on top of these walk-ins too. Forgive my light. But um, this is an alarm wire. They typically will run down to a panic alarm or something. You don't wanna sever those. Police will come knocking. All right, well, I need to open up that electrical section. We're going to test the starting components. If you look, there's fluid right there, and it looks like there's fluid coming here. Like, the, yeah, the capacitor lost its fluid. So, probably going to have a bad start cap. I was able to get the front panel off, too, so I give them credit for that. Looks like junk. Definitely bad. So this thing's supposed to have 243 microfarads. We've got 35, so let's go see what I got in my truck. So I got the starting components here, verified in Copa Mobile. Now I can change out the cap super easy, but the relay is really easy too, but the protector is a nightmare, so that's gonna be fun. I gotta fight this guy to get to the protector. Now these starting components that I had in my truck were actually for someone else. I had ordered them, so I'll call the supply house so long as this guy starts up, I'll call the supply house and order another set. Um, the other 
uh, person that or the other place that these starting components are for the system is operating because I put on a temporary start capacitor so it's okay for now and that way I can get this glycol unit up and running a couple screws and I was able to get this entire electrical box loose so I can get in here to where the protector is now the downside to this is this guy is red hot so we're just gonna have to let it sit for a while um, yeah, because I can't bring water up here on top of the walk-in, and I don't even want to bring a bag of ice because it's just going to condensate everywhere. So we're just going to have to hope that it cools off enough and hope that the, st the new starting component started up. Surprisingly, the component change-out went a lot easier than I thought. Once I pulled that electrical box off, it was super easy. So um, I'm going to let this thing cool off a little bit longer because it is ridiculously hot. Uh, I'm going to start cleaning up some of my messes, and then we'll try to start it up here in a few minutes and cross our fingers. Let's give it a shot. It may turn off on overload still, because it may be too hot. Nope, fired up. Now, when it's this hot, you don't want to turn it off again anytime soon. Let it run for a while. Um, I'm gonna look at the refrigerant charge on this. I don't know how much it is. I'm gonna be very cautious about putting service gauges on something this small, if I don't have to. So we're gonna watch it for a little bit. It's running now. So far, so good. It's already down to 39 degrees. It's running 10.09 amps. And the RLA of the unit itself is 10.8. So we're looking good, looking really good. Crazy though, look at that braze joint. I mean, I do bad stuff too. I'm not saying that I don't do braze joints like that. It's just you usually don't see that from the factory is all. Usually from the factory, it's all perfect and pretty. Um, but I'm not criticizing the fact that that's an ugly brace joint. With as fast as this is coming down to temperature, the current draw that it's running, the fact that we have a clear sight glass, I'm not gonna put my gauges on this. Uh, it has a very small refrigerant charge. That uh, suction service valve is gonna be a pain in the butt to get to, and I wouldn't be surprised if that thing's gonna leak sometime soon. It's all rusted out, so that's a pain in the butt. Um, but I really don't want to be wrenching on that and create a potential leak. I think that we just had bad starting components for this guy. Um, so I'm going to watch it a little bit longer and start assembling it back together. They did a pretty good job designing this unit. It's a little bit tight in here, but I mean, if this was down in a kitchen, it'd be super easy to work on. It's not their fault that I'm crunched on top of a walk-in cooler. Um, this is your evaporator. It's a flat plate heat exchanger and uh, refrigerant in, refrigerant out and then glycol in, glycol out. So um, it pulls glycol from the bottom of the sump and we dump glycol back in through the return hose uh, and that's it. It just chills the glycol in that insulated reservoir. Uh, you got a condensing unit, you got an expansion valve inside here, a receiver right here, a glycol pump right here that pumps the fluid down through the beer lines underground it goes into the beer walk and then it goes underground out to the beer taps. So yeah, everything's looking good. Uh, temperature's down to 33 degrees. It's been 20 minutes, so this thing's kicking butt. All right, I'm gonna, like I said, start assembling it and get out of here. These glycol units sometimes can be in very interesting locations. Um, you know, usually crammed on top of a walk-in box. At least I can get up on top of this one. I've been in some situations where you can barely get to it or, um, you know, it's in such a tight attic that it overheats. Luckily, this one was a little bit tight, but it was a ventilated attic. I mean, there was plenty of air up there. It doesn't get too hot. Uh, it's, it's not a sealed building, basically, you know, so the air goes up through the ceiling tiles and everything. So um, it really does help. But you know, sometimes we got to kind of work within some weird environments, you know, um, maybe not 100% technically safe, that kind of stuff. You got to learn how to be a service technician, you know, um, you got to adapt and overcome. So with this glycol unit, I want to kind of recap a little bit, you know, basically what it's doing is it's keeping the beer lines cold from the beer walk in that that's at 34 degrees to the beer taps, okay? Usually that can go underground or through the attic. If it goes underground, it's you know sitting in a 60 degree environment here in Southern California all the time. And if it goes above the attic, it might be sitting in a 100 degree environment. So we gotta keep those lines cold. And the insulation on the, the beer lines is not enough to cool them down. So they run uh, lines with chilled glycol wrapped th right through the center of those beer lines, right? Or a trunk line. And it runs right through the middle and it just keeps them chilled from point A to point B. So in this situation, the customer called and said, hey, the 
beer is foaming and it's warm coming out of the taps. And the first thing they did was went and checked the beer walk-in and the beer walk-in was at 34 degrees. So we knew that our problem was likely with the glycol unit, okay? So um, went up onto the roof like you guys saw and found that we had bad starting components, okay? Now in this situation, I went in and changed the starting components. I was super lucky that I actually had those in stock. I always like to go back with OEM starting components whenever possible, okay? Um, there's some times that, you know, sometimes you can't, but I prefer to go OEM because you still maintain the UL listing. Everything's still safe. All the caps and everything fit. And you know that they're properly sized. You take the guesswork out of it. If the manufacturer designed that compressor to work with this particular start capacitor, this particular potential relay, current relay, whichever style it is, and this particular overload, the overloads are so important on the starting components, okay? Because the overload is there to protect the compressor. And if the overload um, is oversized or undersized, you can run into some problems with that, either it turning off too early or it not turning off soon enough and the compressor gets too hot, you can damage the windings, damage the oil, all sorts of things, okay? So my personal preference is to go back with the OEM starting components. No judgment to anybody that doesn't do that. It's just my style of doing things, okay? So I was super lucky that I had the starting components in my van. I was able to swap them out. And because the box came down to temperature so fast, I didn't see the need to put service uh, gauges or the unit came down to temp so fast. Had um, it, you know, drag ass coming down and took forever, then yeah, I might have put my gauges on it. It had a sight glass. The sight glass was clear. Um, I decided not to. Okay, that unit, I think it held like two pounds. And, and you know, it was questionable whether or not it was a marginal charge. My gauges probably wouldn't make a huge difference on a two pound system, but still, I just didn't see the need to because boom, it's it came down real quick. And you gotta think about things. Like I said that that service valve is starting to rust out and I did bring that up to the customer. They don't wanna do anything about it yet, but because it's starting to rust out, I really don't wanna be wrenching on that valve to try to get the caps off and things if I don't have to, because the more you wrench on it, the faster it's gonna leak kind of a thing. Because if it's already rusted and corroded, when you're twisting and torquing on the valve, you can kind of tweak it and, and it might start leaking. So if I didn't have to, I didn't want to. And in that situation, I didn't. This particular call happened all the way back in like June, I think. I've been sitting on this video um, so it's been running fine. No complaints from the customer other than changing the filters on it. So, um, I really, really appreciate you guys making it to the end of this video. Again, like I said in the beginning, thank you so much to all of you that have chosen to subscribe to this channel. It's such a humbling thing to see it push the hundred K subscribers. It's amazing. You guys are awesome. Thanks so very much. If you haven't already check out my website. I already said it in the beginning of the video, hvacrvideos.com. Merch available on there that helps to support the channel. Remember, I do live streams on Monday evening, 5 p.m. Pacific. I also go live on the HVAC Overtime channel on Friday evenings, usually around 6.05 p.m. Pacific with my buddies. And we usually just kind of talk about the week. So definitely check that out. And last but not least, I have to say thank you for, to my sponsors, Parker Sporlin and Refrigeration Technologies. Without you guys, this wouldn't be possible. I really, really appreciate you guys. And we will catch you on the next one.